All right, we should be going. So this is the newest, latest installment of the podcast. Um, I've previously been calling it the podcast to end all podcasts. And then when I uploaded to Spotify and Apple Music, it asked me to put in the name. I just decided to go with Christian Alfaro podcast because I don't even know if that original name sounds great. Like if it's not, it's not like the best sounding name, but I I guess the intention behind it was that I want people to learn how to have conversations independently of what they hear their favorite podcasters say or their favorite influencer. I want people to have their own thoughts and their own ideas. And while it's always great to learn from smarter people, um, at some point you have to take initiative you have to take control of your own mind and you have to have your own thoughts uh independently of what other people think uh, to some extent um you can always draw upon other people's intellect but you need to be able to have conversations on your own that's like my goal in having this podcast is to show people what it looks like when two random normal people just have a normal conversation so that way you guys listening or watching can go and have these same conversations with family members with friends um not just coming to the the internet to have that space of thought, but to have that in real life. So anyways, without further ado, this is my guest of the day. My special honored guest is uh, Brady Lane. He's a Hi. guy that I met uh, at the bus. And I just, through conversation, I just realized he has a lot of things to offer as far as my goals in the podcast. So I'll let him introduce himself and I'll, I'll stop talking. Hi, I'm Brady Lane, also Braden Lane, depending on whether how you want to refer to me. I am a senior studying history at Brigham Young University. Um, I am a, I'm 20, almost 24, and I am planning to go teach high school once I'm finished with college. Yeah, uh, what was so impressive to me was um, the way that Brady spoke about education the way he spoke about his motivation for continuing and because this is what I've been finding. I try and do my best to make conversation um, throughout my day on campus. And when I meet people who are close to graduating, I always ask them like how they're doing or motivation wise, uh, how they're feeling. And the, the consensus is like, they're all just dragging their way through trying to finish. When I met Brady, he he mentioned like he, he opened up and shared a lot, a lot more of a deeper motivation that he has for education and Brady, if you don't mind, what is it that you're you're explaining about how, um, like it's more than just grades, right? For you and your in your pursuit of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, um, for each and every one of us, I think our engagement with education is something that's individual. To some people, education is something they love. To some, it's just a you know stepping stone in life. Um, but I think what's most important is trying to find something, um, whatever level of education or wherever whatever you're doing is. Um, is to find a reason, a personal and an intrinsic reason for engaging with the material that you are. You know, I used to be a cybersecurity major um, before I switched to history, and that's a story in and of itself. But um, before I switched, you know, I didn't really enjoy the classes I was taking, but I still tried my best to try to find something in the class that I could use, um, you know, not just for job purposes, but just kind of to improve my personal um, understanding or engagement with the world. And I think that if you are focused on trying to um, find a reason for yourself for why you want to engage with education, I think that is what um, is, that is what helps drive you, you know, um, it drives you to go to class, it drives you to do your assignments. Um, and obviously, those are good for the mechanical and grades part of school. But if your four years at college or your in time in high school is something that you dread and it's just a stepping stone to get onto a career, I don't really think that that's a really good approach to how you should do it. So find a reason for why you want to engage with your education. Yeah, that's so important and that's so valid. I think everyone could uh, could do better to to adopt something of, of that mindset um, and like you said, in their own individual way. I've had the experience, so really quick, I had the experience of um, serving a mission for the church. And I noticed within the first few months, I was in Argentina, um, I noticed how easy it was to get distracted by certain thoughts of like, oh, um, it would be better like if I was at home, it would be better if I was doing this, if I had this and that, all the things I had left behind. And then especially when it got hot, there would always be this thought like in the back of my mind of like, man, imagine just diving into a pool right now, like relaxing, not having to walk for miles. Um, and then I had the experience of getting reassigned during COVID. So I had to go home. And when I got home, 
all the things I used to dream about were there, but yet they were so meaningless to me. Um, they didn't actually fulfill me the way I thought they would. So it's like, you can't um, project like, like you're, you're talking about just like as a stepping stone to get to a destination. Um, you can't uh, project so far into the future based on the premise that like, uh, it'll all be better as soon as my environment changes. It's like, you have to have certain principles guiding you. You have to have um, this foundation uh, and it's like a day by day thing. So if you're, if you're not guided by principle, but only by environment, once your environment changes, it'll expose to you just how, uh, like where, where you are actually. And so it's more important that you are guided by principles. Like Brady was sharing the principle of simply trying to learn something to, to engage with the material and make it personal to you. That principle will help you a lot more than just thinking, Oh, when this is all done, it'll all be you know perfect. And my life will be better. That's not a good way to go about it. So yeah. Um, one, I guess one last introductory thing before we get into what we we're talking about, you mentioned uh, like your, your, your basis of knowledge and history how it covers so many different a, a wide range of topics could you share i guess about the different types of history that you are uh, knowledgeable about yeah i mean i think anyone that engage that has an interest in history like i do you know everyone kind of has their focus of study from time to time um if you do a career obviously you select one area of the world or one topic and you kind of stick with that and really go deep with that um you know I love um, kind of diving into the deep different aspects of different cultures. Um, and so I've kind of bounced around an in interest over the years. And, um, you know, I started out looking into um, the history of World War I and World War II. Um, and then I studied classical Greek and Roman history, um, American history. And then during my time in college, I've done Japanese um, Russian, Chinese, um, and a little bit of Italian hi or Italian and German history as well. I've really enjoyed and um, expanded my horizons there. And I think it's, I think one of the reasons that I've enjoyed doing that is it helps bright, give me a greater appreciation for my own heritage and the history that I have, you know, because even though I'm, I, none of my family is Japanese, for example, um, the things I've learned about religion or about their culture has really um, affected um, my own worldview, and I've really, I really love the opportunity to go and gather these um, these little bits of interesting and f facts and other things from these other cultures and bring them into your own life and apply them how you will. Absolutely. And one one note I wanted to add is how I personally feel that we were um, it, it was meant for us to to find each other just to have this conversation, because in the last several months, I've been I've been increasingly I've becoming increasingly aware of how ignorant I am towards a lot of history, a lot of culture, how little I know about the other side of the world uh, or even like the just the past of um, of how humans have lived and evolved. And I've been doing my, like putting in a little bit of effort, trying to learn these things. And then all of a sudden I just ran into someone who knows a lot. So it was really a blessing for me to meet you. And I wanted to point out one last thing, how you mentioned that you are writing. You know, so your, your thesis is about um, Christianity in Japan uh, and its development. And that's where I want to focus the majority of our time. But before you get into that, um, I think it's important for anyone listening. What have been like some helpful uh, study sources for you. You mentioned to me a several, like a few movies. You mentioned different ways that people who only want to know a basic level of this knowledge, where they could find it. So what are some of those sources? Um, I definitely, one of the first things I'd recommend is, um, you know, just kind of getting general um, understandings about history. As much of a little bit of a meme video it is, um, there's a video called The History of Japan, I guess, by Bill Wirtz that does a really good job of um, over and just kind of giving a broad overview of kind of the rough history of Japan, you know, from ancient history all the way to the modern day. Um, but YouTube has honestly been one of the most interesting resources because, you know, we have a lot of people with different passion projects um, that go and create topics on or create their videos on a whole variety of things that are interesting to them. I mean, you've got videos like Kurt Kiscott and a bunch of others that are really wonderful with what the video essays they produce and you can find 
videos as broad or as specific on topics as you recommend um, or as you'd want. And for me, you know, looking at the history of Christianity in Japan, I think one of the most um, profound resources is, uh, you know, it's the easiest to consume would probably be um, Martin Scorsese's Silence from 2016. Um, he created this video, or he created this movie with uh, Liam Neeson, Andrew Garfield, Adam Driver, um, and it's based off of a historical fiction book um, by a man, I, th I think his name was Shizaku Endo, um, that was produced, I think, in the 80s, um, that just kind of tells the fictional story of these Jesuit missionaries entering Japan after Westerners had been forced out. Um, and it's this really interesting story about faith, um, what it means to be Christian, um, or how do you deal about, how do you go about persecution um, and dealing with that in a society that doesn't want you to have a particular belief, you know, whether that be political or religious. I think there's a lot of different messages you can get from that movie. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, um, well, and to make sure that everyone understands, so it's like a fictional story but it's based in the the reality of, of like of the time. So they're just, they're creating this, the story to illustrate the, the, the environment in which like the culture of that time. Yes. Um, Liam Neeson's character, um, father Ferrara, um, he's based off of an actual missionary um, that had stayed in, that had been allowed to stay in Japan um, because he had renounced his faith and he assumed a Japanese name um, and he kind of was used as a political piece by the um, daimyo and the shogunate, um, just kind of to say, if a West, if the Westerners can renounce their faith, why can't the people in Japan do that? And so it's an interesting thing. So it talks about his story and that. So I would, I would highly recommend it to anyone that's looking for it. It's a little bit violent um, and dark because it does depict, you know, the, persecution and execution of christians for faith and other matters and so it's dark but i would highly recommend it to anyone that wants to find that type of material yeah that's awesome that those kind of movies exist um so i guess we can just dedicate the next like several minutes like 15 minutes i guess of uh an outline i guess an outline of what you've learned about this the spreading of christianity in japan and without further ado i'll just let you go ahead mm -hmm. yeah no problem um so my area of focus has Silence is originally what got me started on my research topic, um, but uh, I f found my way to an Italian missionary who helped oversee the expansion of Christianity in Japan um, named Alessandro Valigano. Um, he was a nobleman who had studied law and, you know, he'd risen through the ranks of the Society of Jesus, you know, Jesuit order, um, and he was assigned to help oversee the Jesuit missions pretty much east of the Cape of Good Hope. So he had a wide jurisdiction over many different missions. And um, he took a particular interest in Japan um, because he believed and found that the people there were um, very faithful to the things that they believed. Um, they were very mild tempered and natured. And he believed that um, the people in Japan would be a would be one of the strongholds of Christianity in the East. And so he did a lot of work to try to help bring Christianity there and really help expand its um, self-sufficiency from the Vatican because you know it's in an, it's an expensive and timely venture to bring European missionaries that are trained in you know Portugal. Um, it takes, you know, two, two and a half years to travel from Europe all the way over to Japan or Macau. And so being able to help foster Christianity um, in Japan using the local converts is something that he really tried to push. He um, really helped push forward these. Um, he really helped try to create this idea of um, a Christianity for Christian or a uh, Christianity for the Japanese. And so he worked with local converts to create um, Japanese or literature for Japanese missionaries to use. He helped expand the training of local priests and 
taught them how to do baptism and really helped try to push that. And one of the things I found that was interesting with him was that he had a really big clashing with his the predecessor that he took over from, um, who his name was Francisco Cabral. And he really he saw the potential that Japan had um, as well, like Volignano, but he really didn't like what he, the Japanese had to offer. And so he was, you know, it, we would you probably use the word racism. You know, he really did not like the Japanese and he really helped um, or he made the missionaries adopt a more traditional approach to teaching rather than, you know, trying to make Christianity work in Japan. He tried to make European Christianity um, forced into the Japanese converts. And so is there's conflict there. Falignano ultimately wins out. Um, and my thesis I've been writing on is kind of connecting him to these little groups of Christians um, that managed to survive in, Christ in Japan after he dies and um, the Japanese government really starts to persecute the Christians. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure if you have like uh much knowledge about this i just remember in high school learning about um the shinto uh i guess spirituality based belief system um mm -hmm. so do you know if there are there any elements of shinto and christianity that cross over that would have made it easier for uh, the japanese people to accept uh this new way of thinking this new belief system that's an interesting question i mean i think and even before Christianity arrives, you have this kind of syncret sorry, you have this kind of syncretic belief that kind of arises in Japan, um, you know, with the local Shinto belief in, you know, worshiping the kami. And, you know, kami is a really interesting topic because, you know, there's a variety of different um, objects or people that can be kami and can be worshipped, you know. And, but the main idea is that kind of, um, I can kind of see, you know, mixing with the Buddhist Shinto beliefs that you have in Japan, and then you have Christianity. Um, one of Christian or one of Shinto's like major things is that there isn't really a concept of sin, um, but you do have this concept of like purity, um, and there's an importance to ritual um, and you know avoiding death and. Um, if you are, if you become quote unquote um, impure, you go through purity rituals, um, and there's great reverence for um, the passing of um, loved ones, um, your superiors, um, and it's it's very centered kind of around um, a cultural um, or a communal and cultural um, cohesion. Um, rather than kind of like individual belief. And Christianity kind of brings in this really interesting thing because it's this foreign religion that talks about how there are certain things that are okay and that are not okay. Um, your belief in Christ is an individual one. And um, you have this foreign person that you've never heard of that you're supposed to um, put your abstract idea of faith in and that he will save you. And there's ideas that kind of existed like this in Buddhism, but Christianity is something that's completely foreign. And it's really interesting to see just how much it's adopted and so well received in Japan. At its height, you have, you know, in the course of about 50 so years of teaching, you have about 300,000 Christians that convert in Japan. Um, and so that's it's interesting. It is. A lot of that does come from um, the missionaries teaching the um, you know, local lords and their um, vassals and their the people that are under them kind of converting along with them. Um, but it's still, you still have these like mass conversions and it's, they, these communities seem to, Christianity seems to take really well to Japan. Um, and then you, obviously, the it kind of becomes a foreign threat later to the um, Japanese government. And so that's why they start to persecute these Christians and try to force Western influence out. Yeah. So since this time period that we're talking about, um, was there ever another period of where like Christianity was kind of like uh, was dormant or like it was um, eradicated 
like was there a period of time where christianity was like kind of just like not uh not like not existing but it wasn't um it wasn't public at all um i mean so this kind of time range you have from about the mid 15 for or late 1540s to about 1630s um you have western christianity in japan um, and that is pretty much eradicated once the Westerners were forced out. But you do have these small communities of Christians that that keep communal practice hidden, um, you know, with Buddhist tradition and kind of masking it in this veil of Buddhist and Shinto belief. Um, and that persists all the way through Japanese isolation um, through the 19th century. Um, and then you have Western when Japan opens back up to Westerners in the 15, 1850s and 1860s, you have Western missionaries are finally coming back to Japan. And they ha there are these small communities of Christians that later kind of rejoin the Catholic Church. Um, but, you know, Christianity has always been a um, minority in Japan, and it still is today. Um, I, th I think less than one percent of the population of Japan even can consider are even consider themselves Christian, which is pretty a very small percentage. So, yeah. So another question is like when the when the missionaries were able to when the Westerners were able to come back to Japan, do you know if like um, if the practices of the Japanese Christians had they remained pretty consistent? Was there any like uh, I don't know if it's deviation or ha was there any like any way in which there were discrepancies between what was taught to them earlier and what they were what they were practicing in that in that moment like uh how well did the christianity or the the teachings that they received how well were they preserved throughout those uh those those few centuries that westerners were not allowed in japan um a lot of like ritual and prayers are something that are easily passed down gen generation to generation because it's just you know it's words spoken it's actions complete actions done um, and so you have the preservation of ritual um, and prayers that are you know taught and espoused by um, the people taught under Valignano all the way back in the 16th century um, and those kind of remain fairly consistent throughout the <clears throat> time of the we call them the hidden Christians um, they kind of remain pretty consistent. And when you get there, you have like very small um, textual or like word changes, but it remains pretty much the same. Um, one of the things that really does change though, is that Christianity in these smaller communities um, becomes more of a communal tradition rather than a thing of like, you know, individual belief. Um, and it's a little bit hard to say, cause I don't, I think it, I don't, I think it might be a little bit unfair to judge the um, the depth or quality of what someone's belief is in Christianity or in whatever they believe, because you can't really know the light and mind of someone that you've never met. Um, but you know, as a general idea, you have these it Christianity becomes something that um, you, these prayers and rituals um, and traditions are something that unite the people of these small villages together um and they continue to practice baptism in in, in in interesting forms from the way that they were taught um and you know icons and things like that are something that are, are interestingly kind of kept you know you have these little statues that they would carve and keep in the family through generations that would um you could espouse to be both the virgin mary and um, Christ and also a uh, depiction of a Buddhist bodhisattva. So you have that, um, you have this syncretic combining of two different religions there. Um, and so, you know, it's core belief of Christianity is something that kind of is, you know, the tenets of atonement and that type of thing are, they kind of slowly away, erode away over time and it kind of becomes a little bit muddled um, in oral tradition and things. But um, overall, it's surprising to see just how well um, these traditions that are taught through these co small communities are kept, you know, despite two and a half centuries distanced from Westerners. Yeah, um, it is super interesting. And the reason I ask is, um, 
is mostly because of uh, our understanding. In the, so we're um, both in the LDS Church. We're both practicing believers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we have the strong belief that um, in the in the centuries following the death of Jesus, that a lot of the teachings of the gospel were corrupted. And historically, like so, uh, we can tell that um, a lot of things were altered. At, like just one classic example being like indulgences of like the Catholic Church um, selling, essentially selling salvation by telling you that if you pay this much money, you can get rid of your sins. Anyway, so it is nice to see how a like a a certain culture can preserve the the like the purity uh, and the teachings of the gospel its essence how it can be preserved through time. Um, it just depends on like the situation because um, these are different people and so they they were able to preserve it pretty well. That's that's something that's that's amazing to see. Um, I guess one last question. So. Uh, it's it's always possible that anyone listening may not have understood everything that was said, which is okay. Um, if there was like one important takeaway, if there is one important lesson that you would want anyone listening to understand about this uh, this piece of this part of history, what would that one thing be that you could say is uh, is one of the more important things to consider? Yeah, um, I think this can kind of go for anyone that believes, you know, either in Christianity or um, a political belief or anything like that. Um, I think one of the most important things that kind of that is important is a recognition recognition of what it what values and what is important to you, um, and doing what you can to preserve or adapt to circumstances with those. Um, for example. Um, these Christians that live in Japan, these Christians that were living in Japan at these, this time, they had the belief, they had this belief in Christ, um, yet their culture really didn't match with it. Their upbringing, it was completely different from what a Christian upbringing would typically be. Um, and you have a government that actively is pursue, pursuing to persecute and either force you to apostatize or execute you. Um, and, you know, you have. There, you have these stories throughout history of um, these marginalized groups of people that um, hold to their beliefs despite um, the difficult and hard circumstances around them. And um, whether those, whether we agree or disagree with what the beliefs or uh, the beliefs or perceptions of those groups are. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, for one, you know, as Christians, we teach that everyone's a child of God, everyone has individual value. Um, and I think that if we are to really focus on what it means to be Christian, um, you know, ritual and belief and everything is important. But I think what matters is what does Christ mean to you? Um, and what are you doing to really help um what are you doing to preserve what it means to you and help those around you because ultimately even though christ even though belief in christ and the atonement and things are something that are kind of pushed a little bit to the side in these community in these communities over time um ultimately christianity and these local traditions really help bring and help bring cohesion to these local communities um, and it's something that they gather around and celebrate frequent holidays and um, they celebrate the baptism of whenever someone would be baptized. It's, it's a communal effort. And I think that if we recognize the, the communal aspect to Christianity and, or whatever belief system we have, I think that that's a very important thing. I agree. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's important to, to remember what is supposed to be the core of all Christianity is loving God and loving people around you. So like you said, what does it mean to you? Like who is Jesus to you and what are you doing about it? Cause he clearly and, um, and unmistakably taught that we should be loving people around us. So to transition, this is going to be like, I guess our conclusion, but I always take the chance that there might be someone listening who either doesn't know if God is real or they have a desire <clears throat> to have some kind of connection with God. Um, they're wanting to know more and to deepen their faith or any, in any um, circumstance, I think we should all be looking to do that to deepen our conversion or strengthen our faith. So if you're comfortable sharing, what have been either some moments or just an experience you've had 
in which you were able to like really strengthen your your uh belief and conviction about of, about god and like through that experience what principle could you uh share that would help someone else who's maybe trying to do the same thing how did you come to really believe and know that god is there for you um so a little bit of background on me i grew up in the latter-day saint church um and you know i had a typical lds upbringing um you know and living outside of you know mainstream quote-unquote mormon the mormon corridor you know idaho utah arizona um i was my religion and my beliefs you know are kind of are quite a minority in the area that i live um and it's for me i think one of the things that really helped um me kind of come closer to god not just kind of in the lds sense but also just kind of in a more personal general christian christian or just kind of sense in general is kind of seeing the difference that um my belief and my way of life and things kind of made not only in my life but in through the influence of what i had among the people around me um you know i went to a small school um and being the one of maybe only two or three members of the church in my entire school um I had a really good opportunity to um, interact with people of different faiths, um, um, both, you know, Christian, Muslim, uh, or, you know, atheist, agnostic. Um, and I think that for me, what really helped my own faith was um, seeing the different and seeing the difference in my worldview and the life that I had had um through what i believed and the happiness and joy that it brought me um when i was able to see how my um how i really affected um the people around me you know the there's this concept in bible or in christian belief you know you talk about the reflection of christ's love through his instrument the instruments of his hands and you know and I think that, um, you know, being an instrument in God's hands, whether, you know, as a missionary um, or, um, you know, just doing general good, I think that if you really want to try to learn who God is, um, try to find, try to find aspects of godliness or um, good in other people rather than trying to immediately look for the negative aspects. I think that um, if you try to find the good in other people, um, you'll start to recognize very positive aspects of yourself. Um, and as you look outward and help other people or observe and see what other people are doing in their lives, you can find aspects within yourself that can um, help you grow in your own personal relationship with God. Um, or in your own understanding of God. I think that's what I would recommend to anyone. Yeah. So essentially you're saying that you can find God by looking at other people and, and discovering the good in them. It's a reflection of God's goodness ultimately is what you're saying. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. And I've been thinking about this for a long, long time because I understand how in the Bible and Book of Mormon alike, it teaches us about the importance of developing charity and without charity, you're nothing. It says to pray to God to have charity. For a long time, I was like really struggling to know how to actually develop that um, and to know what it would feel like. Am I going to feel like my heart is just bursting with all this joy and love and goodness? Or what is it going to look like to me? And then over time, I've just had experiences where whether it be like a disagreement with someone or like some kind of unpleasant interaction to then have to find a way to forgive them and to also hope that they forgive me as well. I had this realization at one point that if I were to switch places with someone and not only just right now, but if I were to go back to where, um, where they had their beginning and live their whole life up as they have up to this point now, I have no guarantee that I would be doing any better than they are right now. If not, I could be doing worse than they are. I could have made worse decisions. And so in every single person situation, you should simply look at them and understand that like that it's a miracle that they've made it here. It's by God's grace that they've made it this far in their life. And that they have done the best that they could with like uh, with their given circumstances. 
And while they could have done better, um, theoretically, it's like, uh, realistically, you don't know if you would have done better. So you you look at them and you, just, you should simply just be grateful that whoever you're talking to, whoever you're looking at, be grateful that they're even there. Um, be grateful that God preserved them and, and helped them make it as far. And that's a reflection of how, how far you've made it because you could have done better, but you didn't. So you should never judge anyone else for like their situation. You should, the understanding that we should all have like, like I love that idea of the Japanese culture, how, how important it is to have this sense of, of um, co- like you called it communal cohesion or something like that, where we all have a spirit of harmony and uh, a spirit to work together and maintaining purity and all that stuff. It's so beautiful. So yeah, I really do appreciate that. I think like anyone listening, just to reiterate, look for good in other people and you will ultimately see a reflection of God. That's a really important lesson. And as you continue reading the scriptures, you'll, the, the thing about the scriptures to me is that the scriptures are just simply meant to reveal truthful principles, whether it be through someone teaching it directly or through stories that they share. There's always principles reflected that you will find resurfacing. And the more the more times you see a certain principle, that must mean that it's it's like a truthful principle, the fact that it's reflected so, so many times. And then you look for those in, in your life. So yeah, I think it's a perfect example of like what a Christian should do is you should look for good in other people. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I had for today. Brady, if there's anything else you'd like to say to finish, you can go ahead. Uh, if not, we only have about two minutes left anyways, and then we'll just end the recording. Well, no, I want to say thank you for having me on, Christian. This has been a wonderful opportunity, and I hope that the people that do listen to your podcast are all able to um, – I wish them all the best, and I hope that um, whatever is going on in their lives, that they're able to um, do what they can to try to find um, – I wish them the best and I hope that they are able to see and try to recognize, um, you know, either God's hand in their life or um, whatever, um, if they believe in providence or whatever they believe in, I hope that they're able to recognize, you know, that God is out there in the world um, and that he, it's very difficult to kind of recognize his hand is, but sometimes the most important thing is recognizing the small things in life. Um, and the small things that go well, the small lessons we learn, I think that that has helped me through a lot of difficult times. And I, as we go into the new year, I think that trying, I think that if we try to look for those small opportunities, that that will lead us to good. So once again, thank you for having me on Christian. Yeah. And that'll be the thing I end on is that that's exactly what I did. And that's how it led to this opportunity was that I just had the smallest inkling of like a thought of, I should talk to this person that I'm standing next to. And then I went and talked to you and we had our conversation and here it is uh, leading up to this moment. And hopefully people will learn from this. So like the fact that I just had enough courage and trust in God to just simply act on a, a little thought, like it may be in my mind, it could have been inconsequential. Like if I had not spoken to you, who knows, like if it would have made the biggest difference, but the fact that I took this opportunity, we don't know if this turned out to be like important for someone else. So that's all I was, I was going to say is act on those small spiritual thoughts that you get. Um, you never know where it could lead, but that'll be it. And I think we have less than 10 seconds. So I'm just going to end the recording, but thank you, Brady. Have a great day. You as well. See ya.